All right, talking about data acquisition. So this is chapter two in our textbook. And really, this is going to just give us some general terminology, right? Um, as well as help us unpack some stuff. There's, there's honestly, there's a few inaccuracies in the textbook, so we'll talk about those as well. Um, but basically, the gantry, um, the gantry of a CT scanner is kind of the large plastic uh, donut hole thing that is has all the computer components, has the X-ray tube, has the detector array, and all those things inside of it. It also has a bunch of electronics and computers used for controlling how the x-ray tube works and things like that, as well as a, a, a huge cooling apparatus to help cool this thing because it's producing a whole lot of heat. Um, in addition to that, the gantry can tilt, it can move. Typically there's controls on either side of the gantry, um, and the gantry also has like a microphone and a speaker set up inside of it so that we can use the gantry to talk to the patient. Um, I, a lot of Siemens scanners, it's like they paid Garrison Keillor to talk to the patient, so, and he can speak like 50 different languages, like he can speak Vietnamese. Um, so there was a radiologist I used to hang out with, he loved whenever we had drunk patients for me to have the x-ray machine talk to them in Vietnamese or German or whatever. Um, you can also record your own voice saying things, which makes for hilari hilarity too. Um, so I won't share with you all the things I've had a CT scanner say to people, but um, you can have them say some pretty off-the-wall stuff. Um, also, the patient table seems kind of uh, common sense, but it is wired pretty directly to the gantry, and so as the table's moving, the gantry is making the movements that it it's makes, and so it can calculate all of that really, really closely. Okay. So within the gantry, um, we have slip rings, which are technology that was developed first by for NASA, right? Which basically is um, it's a moving part that allows for high voltage electricity to pass between these moving parts. So um, they have basically little brushings like this that are moving around inside of the ring that allow the conduction of electricity through that moving part. And the reason NASA needed it was, you know, for for disengaging rockets as space shuttles are flying up into the air, right? So it was initially developed for NASA, it was developed to withstand a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, and to conduct a whole lot of electricity, and that's what we use in CT scanning. So the development of the slip ring te technology is pretty much one of the big moments in CT, and it's why we'll have this discussion of, of scanner generations. Like I think in the textbook she talks about like first generation, second generation, both those scanners were developed without slip ring technology. When you have third generation, all of a sudden slip rings are available. Right? Now I've mentioned a little bit, this is me being a major nerd right now, um, but I talked a little bit about how the research and development for CT scanning came out of the money that was developed from the sales of Beatles records. Right? The Beatles were an enormously popular band in, in Great Britain. Who here still likes the Beatles? I like the Beatles. Is anyone else? Okay. They're a great band. They were on the EMI record label, and their, their albums sold millions of copies worldwide. So tons of money poured into EMI, and EMI took that money and put it into research and development, and one of the things they developed was the first-generation CT scanner. Right? Um, there's a lot of weird associations between music and CT for some reason. So another one is that slip ring technology. So just historical fact. Um, who here has ever heard of a Moog or a Moog synthesizer? It's an old analog synthesizer. They used it in soundtracks and stuff like that back in the 60s and 70s. It has a very distinct noise, distinct sound that it can make. Um, the electronics developer who made the Moog synthesizer, Robert Moog, was the cousin of John Moog, the guy who developed slip ring technology. So, um, again, there's these weird, I don't know what it is about CT history that has these weird musical facts to it. Um, cooling systems are really, really critical to the CT tube um, and the x-ray source because we're producing quite a bit of heat, a whole lot of heat. Um, and then we're going to provide some kind of filtration. Typically the filtration that we use is in what shape? Do you all remember? Which? Bow tie. Yeah, a bow tie filter. Yep. Um, because a patient's basically shaped like a hot dog, right? Um, and then we're going to collimate 
both on the tube side and the detector side within a CT scanner. Right? Now, within nuclear medicine, we talk about what edge packing, I think, is a term, that, uh, where basically what happens is as these detectors are detecting radioisotope um, interactions within the body, the, I'm very limited knowledge of nuclear medicine, we can have isotope kind of intensify detection at the edges of our detectors, right? The same thing can happen with the CT detector array, and so we'll talk about how we, what we do to prevent that. Um, but, so that's a, an aspect of collimation. Finally, when we talk about detectors, typically we're talking about the detector array. A detector is just a single element within that array. Um, and one thing worth noting in our textbook, page 16, box 2-3, she indicates that a high KVP is used to increase the intensity of the x-ray beam, increasing its penetrating ability, and thereby reducing patient dose. This is simply not true. Um, it was, this is the case with diagnostic x-ray, that you can increase the KVP and, in essence, decrease patient dose because more of the beam is passing through the patient's tissue without hitting like a brag peak or giving off all of its energy. Right? Um, but... With the way that CT technology and com the com computational algorithms work, as we increase the KVP in a CT scanner, it is actually increasing patient dose. And so the research, current research, tells us this is simply not true. That the way to reduce dose in CT is actually the opposite of the way that we re reduce dose in, in X-ray. We are going to decrease KVP. And it has to do with, again, the way the machine works, the way these... Uh, post-patient collimators work, the way the computer works with the information it's receiving to, to alter patient dose. Okay? Slip ring technology. Um, again, the main purpose for slip ring technology is they allow the gantry frame to rotate continuously, and this is what makes helical scanning modes possible. So, Again, first generation, second generation scanners, all they could do was axial acquisition. So they were CAT scans, right? Computed uh, axial tomography, right? That's what CAT scans stood for. Um, once we hit the third generation of scanning, we're no longer dealing with CAT scans, right? The, the, that's, an old, that's an old term, and it's honestly, it got abandoned sometime in the 1990s, but people still use it. Right? So it's another case for how policy and stuff or terminology changes, but people are really slow to pick up on these terminological changes. But what we're talking about is in axial scanning, let me draw on this thing real quick. We would have like the table would move and then we'll scan. Then the table will move and then we'll scan. And then the table will move and then we'll scan. And then the table will move and we'll scan. And if we have a, a, a pitch of one, the movement is equal to the scanning thickness, right? So if the pitch was one, for a pitch of one, this would be like a one, for example, like a one millimeter movement, oh my goodness, and this would be like, or a one millimeter slice thickness, and this would be like a one millimeter movement, right? That's axial scanning. Move, scan, move, scan, move, scan. And this is what, what we were referring to when we called it CAT scan, right? Computed axial tomography. So slip ring technology, once it enters into the game, we have the development of helical or volumetric scanning. What is that talking about? This is a continuous kind of scanning. So there's, it's scanning while it's moving. If you set it up in a GE scanner, you will get these two different patterns. This one would be, because we still do some protocols with axial, like a CT of the head. We still might do axially. And so it would look like that in a GE scanner. It would literally look like a little, the top of a little castle. Um, versus helical, it's just moving and scanning all at the same time, and that's because of that slip ring technology. Okay, generators. Um, I mentioned, I think, earlier in this year that I really, really tried last semester to get a CT scanner here on campus. And the we had the scanner, right? We would have a room that we could 
very easily convert to a CT scanner, but the, the number one problem that we ran into was the electricity required to run a CT scanner. So now I'm looking at an educational CT scanner that just uses light um, to do uh, CT reconstructions. But these things produce a, a, high, a very high voltage electricity. Um, who here, has anyone had an opportunity to see the CT gantry with the gantry cover removed? Has anyone seen it yet? Okay. Um, there is an illustration in our book of what it looks like on page 15. Um, it's pretty awesome, in all honesty. Um, uh, has anyone had a chance yet to see the documentary Particle Fever about the Haldron Collider? Has anyone seen this movie? It's amazing. Um, and I just say, mentioned this as a caveat. The, the technology that they have inside the CT scanner, um, I mean, it is of a similar level of complexity as the stuff that they're using at CERN to determine the origins of the universe, right? It's very, very high-tech stuff, very cool to see. Um, and I always think about the Terminator robots for some reason, um, but I really like the CT scanner. Um, so she talks about how increasing the voltage KV will increase the intensity of the X-ray beam, and I mentioned this is simply not true. Um, this was an, a belief that came out of diagnostic X-ray, um, and what current research is telling us is this is not the case anymore because of the computational part of CT, largely. The two big changes that are driving CT right now, I mean, there's stuff getting published every day right now about CT, and it's largely the computational parts of CT. Like the hardware, the gantry, that stuff is pretty stable. I mean, there's still research going into new kinds of detectors and new kinds of x-ray tubes. But what's really driving the research now is the computer, the computer side, side of it and how that can reduce patient dose and increase uh, image quality. Cooling systems. I mentioned these things are basically giant toaster ovens. So there's going to be blowers and filters and all sorts of things to dispel the excess heat. We don't. Uh, radiation therapy, they use liquid coolant, right, for linear accelerators. They have some kind of cooling system that flushes um, liquid coolant, I think, through the target or something. I don't fully understand it. But um, is, am I correct? Am I just barking up a tree? Have y'all learned about the insides of linear accelerators yet? A little bit? Um, I believe they use a liquid coolant and that they have liquid cooling systems inside of them. Is it just water? Distilled water? Okay. Um, CT, we don't have water or anything in that. It was just blowers and fans and filters and things like that. Filtration. Um, this is the little bow tie guy. So it's going to allow us to shape the x-ray beam and remove any low energy photons. When we produce x-rays within the tube, um, we talked about how we're making rainbows, right? There's a spectrum of energies that's being produced. We have a kilovolt peak, and, but there's a lot of energies that are being made below that kilovolt peak. If it's not of a sufficient energy to at least um, pass through the patient's body and activate the detector, then it's not a diagnostic photon, and so we would want to just filter it out of the beam, right? So what, in essence, we're talking about is we are hardening the beam, right? We're decreasing the amount of x-rays that are exiting the tube because we're filtering out some of the weaker ones, so we're decreasing the amount, but we're increasing the average energy of those x-rays by filtering out the weak ones, right? Um, so it's going to reduce radiation dose. That's the primary reason that we do this, is it reduces radiation dose to the patient. And it can also minimize beam hardening artifacts on the image. We'll look really closely at beam hardening when we look at um, CT of the brain, because the base of the skull is probably the number one place that just naturally causes beam hardening. So let's talk a little bit about it real quickly, but we'll have a more in-depth discussion. What am I talking about? First of all, let me draw the little bow tie. Oh my goodness. Um, and this is the x-ray tube. There's little x-rays exiting the x-ray tube and they hit this, this bow tie guy, right? If they're not strong enough to penetrate the bow tie, they don't exit the filter, right? So there's more x-rays going towards the bow tie than are leaving the bow tie, right? So these en the energies, though, are higher. They're a higher energy. 
higher energy, but less quantity. What would be another word for x-ray folks? What would be another word for the energy of it? What am I talking about? They have a higher energy, so they have a higher what? What does that mean? It starts with a Q. I'm talking about quantity versus quality. quality. It's a higher quality x-ray beam. Y'all tracking with me? Does that make sense from a therapy point of view? Y'all talking about beam quality? Okay, cool. All right. Um, now, so I have, in essence, I have hardened the beam, right? Now, that's, it, that's with a bow tie shape. And the reason I said it's bow tie shaped is because patients are basically tubular in shape. And so I want, yes? <laughs> okay, you're just trying to get away from me. <laughs> All right. Um, now let's flip. Let's flip the paradigm a little bit, and let's say that we've got a filter now that's circular shaped, which is basically what's happening at the base of the skull. If you could see through my head, right, the base of the skull is basically circular shaped, right? And so I would have a filter with some soft stuff. It's like the Klondike ice cream bar, right? This is the chocolate part out here, and this is the ice cream on the inside, right? That's my brains. Um, <laughs> So what happens is the x-ray photons that are interacting with the skull are going to be hardened by one side and then hardened even more by the other side, right? They're going to get, hard, they're going to get filtered on this side, go through the ice cream, and get filtered on the other side too. That's what, this is what happens. I'm sorry, it's a crazy metaphor, but oh my goodness, it looks like I'm drawing Charlie Brown. Um, uh, the point here is that what happens is by the time this stuff reaches the detector array, we are going to have streaks on our images. We're going to have streaks on our images because we've hardened the beam such that um, we're no longer getting s soft tissue detail from the like s level of the cerebellum, the, um, <coughs> the uh, brain stem, and things like that. So brain stem, hip, uh, hypothalamus, all those kinds of things are very difficult to see on CT images because of beam hardening artifacts. Okay. Collimation. Collimation is going to restrict the x-ray beam to a specific area. So this would be collimation on the tube side of the x-ray tube. Um, it's going to reduce scatter radiation, improve contrast resolution, and decrease the patient dose. All these things are good things, right? And it tracks with kind of how collimation works in x-ray. So let's talk a little bit about this area. Let's imagine that I had an area that the collimator is allowing x-rays to be produced within. So x-rays, when I produce x-rays, we talked about how x-rays are being produced within the, within the tube. They're isotropic. That means they go off in every possible direction, right? But the x-ray tube is covered with lead. It's covered with lead. So it's only going to allow x-rays to exit going in the direction of the patient, right? So I've got a tube covered in lead, and it's got a little hole in it that lets the x-rays out. The x-rays are being produced in every possible direction in here, but that tube is stopping them. Okay? So we have a central part of the ray, and then we have an area that we've collimated to. It looks like a penguin barfing <laughs> on a piece of paper. Um, so this is just going to restrict the x-ray beam to that specific area that we're trying to scan, and this is going to reduce scatter radiation, right? Because as this beam interacts with the patient, we're going to have scatter events. So here's my little patient over here. And this is the area, let's say we're x-raying. Um, as this x-ray interacts with the patient, there's going to be Compton scatter events that happen going every which way, right? The more I can collimate this, the less scatter there's going to be. And this is going to give me a, a prettier picture, right? So it's going to improve the contrast resolution. The reason for that is, is simply this. So here's my detector ray on the other side. Let's say I have an x-ray going off in this way, and it pings off and comes down here. Now it's giving me the information that's not really true to the object I'm scanning. right? So it has created noise, and that noise is going to be in the form of poor contrast resolution. Okay. 
And then as you can imagine, it's decreasing the patient dose because if I made this collimated area bigger, I'm increasing the exposed area of the patient, right? It needs to be just as big as my detector array, okay? Now, that's collimation on the tube side, right? So this is all happening on the, the tube side. Let's talk a little bit real quickly about what happens on the detector side because there is a form of collimation that happens on the detector side. And let me see where it's at in our book. It has to do with um, scanner acceptance on page 19. Scatter acceptance. So we've got the detector array, and it's between these little... Uh, I'm drawing them much bigger than they would be, but there's um, like a spacing material between the detectors, right? So the spacing material is taller than the detector, right? So again, these scattered photons are coming in at weird angles, right? So when I talk about the acceptance of it, it's these angles here to which the detector array is recessed within the spacing material, right? It's going to allow for scatter angles that are pretty small. But if I had a scattered photon that's coming in at some wild, crazy angle like this, it's not going to reach the detector array because it's going to hit that spacing material. Right? It functions very similar to a grid in x-ray. Right? But we, a lot of times we call it detector collimation. Um, So the detectors themselves are going to be able to collect information regarding the degree to which each um, anatomic structure scanned attenuated the x-ray beam. And so we're going to relate that to linear attenuation coefficients, which we're going to further relate to Hounds field units. And that's ultimately what's going to be displayed for um, the tech and for the doctor. And these detectors are made from a variety of substances. She lists some of them. Most of them are solid state crystal now. Um, in fact, I would say most of them are cadmium tungstate. We've pretty much gone away from the xenon gas stuff, xenon gas, and most stuff is solid state crystal detectors. And the reason for that is simply patient dose. With the advent of the cadmium tungstate, we were able to reduce patient dose by 25%, simply because it stops, like the, she talks about in the book, that the xenon gas only fluoresces for like 85% of the photons that interact with it. Cadmium fluoresces for that for like a lot more of the photons. Um, she doesn't give a number, I don't think. Um, but because it's more sensitive to photon interaction, it's, we we're able to decrease the patient dose just because of the detector. So most CT scanners that are in operation today are solid state crystal variety and of those I would say the big area that people are working at is the cadmium tungstate. Um, and this goes to the point of frankly of money and cost and government policy. Medicare has just released a, a pay scale in which they have said Working towards the year 2017, we're going to start reducing the money that we'll give you for scanning on an older CT scanner, right? If the CT scanner doesn't have modern detector arrays in it, if it does not have the ability to produce a patient dose report, all those things are going to impact your reimbursement, right? And so that has now incentivized hospitals to increase their awareness of CT dose, Right? So they're more or less forcing, the government's forcing hospitals to adopt new scanning technology which will decrease patient dose. Um, okay. Let's talk real quickly about scanner generations. I think she has an illustration of it. No, she doesn't really. I'll draw it out here on the slide. All right. The very first CT scanners, the first generation CT scanner was the one uh, developed by uh, Sir Geoffrey Hounsfield. Um, 
and Alan McCormick and the folks at, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the hospital, it was in Great Britain, um, but the very, it could only scan brains, right? The very first CT scanner could only scan the brain. Um, reconstruction of a single image, I believe, took 24 hours. Um, so the computational power in the, in the mid-1970s was simply not the same as what we have at this time. I mean, some of these computers were still using, like, punch cards and stuff like that. Um, so, again, one of the things that's further improved CT is just, is just the, the way that technology is developing. Have you all ever heard of, I think it's called Moore's Law. Have I mentioned that in this class? Basically, Moore's Law is an understanding that every, I think it's every two years or something, um, the cost of new hardware, new processing power, decreases by half, and the power of new processing power in, in, increases by twice, right? So every two years, the stuff costs less and it can process more. It costs less and processes more. So there's an exponential increase in, in computer processing power along with a decrease in its costs. Um, and Moore's Law applies to a lot of things, not just com computers. Um, but these very first CT scanners, so they still had a gantry aperture, but what happened was it had a single like pencil thin x-ray beam so here's like a pencil and it moved across like this and at the same time a little detector moved across like this right so that would be a single slice acquisition a pencil thin x-ray beam and a small detector would move across like this right and then it would rotate and it would move like this as the detector moved like this. And then it would rotate. And when it got to the end of like a single slice, it would have to reset the entire mechanism since it didn't have slip rings. It would have to reset all the way back to zero and then it could start, slanting, start scanning the second slice. So we would have to make acquisitions from every possible basically dial of the clock to make a single slice, so scanning times were really, really long. Like the very first CT scanner, I think it took like 20 or 30 minutes just for it to do a CT scan. Um, and the controls for it looked very similar to an X, like the, 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 the X-ray machines, the older X-ray machines that we had. It was dials and rotors and things like that. Um, so you can imagine there were problems with patient motion. Um, there were problems with the detector itself. It caused a lot of problems. So the, this would be first generation. Second generation was similar to the first generation. It still lacked that slip ring technology. But what it, what it did have that was different was instead of a pencil thin x-ray beam, it had a fan beam. And the detector array on the other side was bigger. So it's the same basic scanning. So this would be second generation. It had it do the same movements where where they would scan together, reset and move, scan together, reset and move, scan together, like a really bad robot dance, right? <laughs> um, I think second generation X-ray, second generation CT dance should be out there somewhere, but it's, I don't think it ever made it to the dance floors. Third generation, and this is where things get weird. It's like one of those really bad <clears throat> sequels to a movie that becomes a prequel or something. Like, isn't, like, Home Alone 4 or something really, like, Home Alone 0 0.5? Or, or I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like especially horror movies are like this. Like, it's like there's Friday the 13th, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then, like, H2O, and then Redemption, and then... So something like that's going to happen, so hold on to your hats. The, between the second and third generation, we have um, the advent of slip ring technology. So now we have the ability to... We're just going to produce x-rays on this side in a fan beam. So we, we adopted the fan beam from the second generation. And now we're going to have a detector array like this. And that's going to rotate continuously around the patient. This is third generation scanning. Slip ring technology allows this thing to just rotate continuously around the patient. Interestingly enough, the 
computational side of things has not really changed. From generation to generation to generation, the same basic statistical analysis is happening on the computer end. Just the hardware is changing. Then we got really wild and crazy, and we said, what if we have a x-ray tube that's making a fan beam and the entire interior of the aperture is a detector array. This is fourth generation. And there were scanners that were produced like this. They were very, they were some of the early really fast CT scanners. But the problem with it is having a de detector array that big and the computational power that's required to like shut off parts of the detector array while it's moving was just crazy expensive, right? So n we do not use, this is what I was talking about, this is the Friday the 13th H2O CT scanner. We do not use the fourth generation. Everything went back to the third generation and it just, that's where it will be probably for the foreseeable future. So third generation is it. All current CT scanners are third generation scanners. I always just think about those stupid movies that, I don't know, like Star Wars. Star Wars is a good example. Like they tried to go back and remake the first three Star Wars. They all sucked and now we've got the new Star Wars, right? Um, okay. A data acquisition system or DOS. Um, this is going to measure the photons that pass through the patient and strike the detectors. And it converts that analog signal, because the, the detectors are giving off a, a fluorescent signal. So the DOS detects that analog signal, converts it to binary, um, and, uh, and it, so it's, with, it's within the gantry. It's actually floating along right there beside the detector array within the gantry. The analog signal is immediately be conver being converted to a digital signal, right? Patient table. So as you can imagine, if we're doing this acquisition where we're going to be continuously acquiring information while we move the table, the table actually has a lot of computers inside of it to, to make sure that table movement is accurate. So part of um, quality control for CT scanning is just simply making sure that the table moves to the degree that it says it's moving when it moves. Um, sometimes we call it incrementation, feed, step. I usually call it step. Um, and there's numbers up at the top of the CT scanner. Patients love to say, is that my weight? I didn't think I weighed that much. But it's, it's just the step numbers, right? It's just the degree to which they're moving along the z-axis, right? For the radiation therapy folks, y'all have a slight advantage because the exact same kind of metrics are being applied with the gantry table and radiation therapy. All right, we have an X, Y, and Z axis. Um, so X, in this case, is, you know, in this direction, and this is largely how the patient has centered themselves on the table. So I have a patient laying on the table, right? Here's their head. If they scoot too much one side or the other, I'm going to have some anatomic cutoff, and there can actually be artifacts that are produced by that, right? The y-axis is the degree to which I've raised or lowered the table with the patient on it, right? And again, I want all of these things to be pretty close to an imaginary point right in the middle of the gantry. Does anyone know what that imaginary point is called? Isocenter. Isocenter. Thank you. So um, these controls of the horizontal movement of the table along the z-axis um, are the domain of the machine purely the domain of the machine. So it's the degree to which um, the patient moves in this direction here. So x-axis is the domain of the patient, me telling the patient you need to scoot over a little bit or move around. Y-axis is the domain of the, of the tech. It's my responsibility to make sure that the, the table's raised or lower the appropriate amount. And then the z-axis is the domain of the machine. Now, you can hit table limits, right? Um, so it's especially important, especially if you're dealing with a, with a bariatric patient, for you to know what the limits of the table's movement are. So if you see people scanning people upside down or in different directions, maybe because the table limits. Some of these older 
CT scanners especially, you really had to work with your table limits. So most table limits are marked on the CT scanner somewhere. And you'll want to set up the patient in accordance with the limits to which the, the table can move. You said the Z-axis was the domain of the table? Yeah. Okay. It's, the, it's the table's power to c control that. Now, you can manually adjust things. So eventually, I'm going to set an ISO center. I'm going to tell the CT scanner, this is our zero point, right? I'm going to tell it what my zero point is. And that zeroing point is zeroed along the X, Y, and Z axis, right? It's zeroed along the X, Y, and Z axis. And so I will make sure the patient's adjusted left to right appropriately, make sure they're up and down appropriately, and then I'm going to advance them into the gantry aperture and make sure that they're in it on the Z axis to the correct degree. And then I'm going to hit zero. Everything will move from that point. So if I make any adjustments, similar again, similar to making adjustments in the radiation therapy department, the adjustments I, I'm going to make are be primarily with the table. I could raise or lower it, move it in and out, and know where I am in relation to that zero point. This is especially important if you're doing any kind of CT special procedures because you can set a zero point and then you can make measurements in any direction from that zero point and know about where you're going to be. Anatomic landmarks. Um, so once we've got the patient position on the table, we're going to record an anatomic landmark by setting a zero to it, right? Um, we call this sometimes referencing the table. So here's some commonly used ones, the sternal notch, xiphoid process, iliac crest. Um, they should sound somewhat familiar to the x-ray folks, um, but largely we're looking for very, very obvious things. I don't typically even need to like ask the patient or even palpate for them because once they're laying on the table, you can, you can identify them with your eye. You can see, okay, there's the, there's the ASIS. I know that's about where the iliac crest is. I can zero there, right? Um, I, you can see pretty clearly, okay, there's um, a xiphoid, not, or a xiphoid notch down here, but the sternoclavicular um, process right here. And then for zeroing for a brain, you pretty much are just zeroing right here on their forehead. Um, but you're going to be able to see X marks like laser X marks, right, inside that gantry tube. So you'll need to tell the patient, close your eyes, there's some lasers in here, right, while I'm zeroing. And then once I'm done zeroing, you can open your eyes. Um, questions about any of that? 